So, 10th April, 12.41 p.m. The old baby. Defendant's antechamber. Okay, well, I guess so. We are going to be having our little break over here until we continue with our trial and see if we can interrogate uh, Mr. Benedict Cumberbatch. Ah, Gina, how are you holding up? I starting to feel quite warmly towards her frequent cold shoulders now. Yeah, we're getting used to it. We can interpret it as her way of being, like, friendly with us. Genie! Are you alright? Why aren't you saying anything? What's the point, eh? Hey? Why go all this trouble and fight so hard? For the likes of me. Because we believe in you. What? You saw it. That picture. What picture? Ah, uh, you mean this? The photograph taken by Harley's red hand recorder? Well, I didn't think it would have a captured a scene like this, that's for sure. It's hopeless. Anyone who sees that's gonna think I did it, ain't they? Oh. I won't pretend it wasn't a bit of a shock when the prosecution first presented it to the court. But it doesn't really tell the full story in my eyes. You know what they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, but I am still not convinced of those one thousand words. I need like a billion of them to be convinced. Surely you've gotta have your doubts about me now. You can't still think I'm innocent. Oh, it could very well be that you were defending yourself, or in this case, could possibly be that you were quote-unquote threatening winding back in order to open the open the place and see if something was there to see your goals but you never had any intention of killing people you're not a bad person like that no, of course i can hmm genie why didn't you talk to us tell us what really happened that night eh the windows cleverly managed to piece together a lot of new information, but still, we'd really like to hear from you. Uh, Alright then. It was after we'd had that dinner together at your place, right Aris? Then we all had a chat up in your office, didn't we? Yeah, I remember. You're talking about the time when, uh... Iris described the manuscript that Sean's was hiding. Well, not hiding, but keeping it in a windy back shop. After that, I just couldn't get to sleep. So I slipped out and went down the street to the 2 to 1, to windy back's place. I had to know if Iris' story was there or not. The Hound of the Baskervilles. I don't know what it's about or nothing. But if you ask me, there's something in it that Sean's don't like. Something what he don't want people reading. So that's why he liked to hire spot sticking in love with Windy Back for safekeeping. At least, that's what I thought at the time. So you broke into Windy Bags? I just had to know if it was there or not. I mean, I had no idea all that was gonna kick off, did I? Yeah, well, I figured that it had something to do with the manuscript. Like, that was your main reason for why you went there in the first place. To check if if the story is true, for Iris' sake. I struck the lock and snuck inside. It was dark as you like in there. So I gave the oil lamp on the counter a bit of wink. And that's when... What do you think you're doing? Ah! I nearly died. I did. Next thing I knew... I grabbed the gun on the counter and was waving it in the air like... I don't know what. Oh, 
You're the girl who wasn't here this afternoon. I don't think pickpockets went in for armed robbery. The, the mantle script. Have you got it here? The chums leave a load of papers with you. A story. I beg your pardon? The hound of the... something or other. If it's here, I want to see it. Oh, I'm sorry, old lady. But I'd sooner die than relinquish an article belonging to one of my customers. I don't want it. What would I do with it anyway? I just want to see if it's here, that's all. Oh, you want to see it, do you? I want to know if Sean's really pawned it here or not. Please, just let me see it, and I'll go. Oh, very well then. But for Peter's sake, stop pointing my gun around, would you? So then the old cove unlocked the storeroom door, and we both went inside. And it was there alright, the mantle scrapped. Shums weren't lying after all. You, you did all that just to check for me, Ginny? Yeah, she sure did. Anyway, then there was a bit of a kick up out in the main bit of shop. And that is when the brothers came in. The Skoken brothers arriving on the scene, yes. What was that noise? Someone's breaking in! Here, is there some burglar's convention here tonight that I don't know about? I forgot to shut the door behind me. Sorry. I better go and take care of it. Could I possibly have my gun back? Oh. Well, I'll come with you and... Now don't be foolish, young girl. You must stay right here. Don't leave this room under any circumstances. Winback sure is a courageous person at times. And with that, he took the gun out of me and... and walked back into the shop. I'm back in the storm, like he said, straining me ears in the dark to hear what was going on. So when I got into a bit of a scrap, I started to think I should help, see. So I was just about to go out the storeroom myself, when... I heard a couple of shots go off. Two, I think. Almost at the same time. And then there was, right at my feet, lying face down on the floor. I was right next to the storeroom door, so I slammed it shut and locked it quick as he liked. And because you thought whoever had shot Mr. Weedback might come for you. Yeah, so I went to grab the old cub's gun. I figured I'd put up a fight at least. But when I got a better look at him, I knew. Weedy back was a goner. I felt funny in the head all of a sudden. Kind of dizzy. And after that, I don't remember nothing. That must be when you passed out, you know. If, if I hadn't done what I'd done. The old curve might still be alive. Did you tell the police everything you just told us? Of course I did. But they didn't believe a word of it, did they? All they said was, if I kept telling lies, I'd make things even worse for me. Well, we are not operating under the same mentality over here. I mean, it is as we always believe in. Innocent until proven guilty. You, Gina, have told us your side of the story. You trust us enough to tell us this. Like, a part of you believes that we would believe you in this. And we are going to believe you. In similar fashion to how you trusted us, you trusted us with this, we are going to be trusting you with this. You'll be alright, Gina. Don't worry. And just stay strong a little longer. 
When is he about to put up the real carpet for the meal? And I cover what was there in the afternoon. That Eggert Benedict. I still remember how he looked at me. Like I was nothing. He, he was there that night. And we don't know his real name yet. But I'm convinced that he's involved somehow. Anyway, thank you for telling us what happened, Gino. I appreciate your honesty. You what? You can leave it all in your honest capable hands now, Genie. Yep. Mr. Narodo. Yes? How come you trust me? I don't get it. Well, if I am to think back on uh, on uh, Ryonosuke's adventures up to this point, it's not like you are the first person who goes through this sort of stuff, you know? I mean, have you forgotten what happened here before? Come on. It was only two months ago. Me and McGill did. We told you a whole pack of lies. And he got the bog trotter off with him. Even though he was a killer. Mm, no, I could never forget that. Oh. I did what I thought was best at the time. But the pain of that error of judgment doesn't get any easier than there. Still, don't forget that I also made you a promise. I told you that I'd be on your side at a bit of end, no matter what. What if I'm lying? You could be working to get another killer off the hook, for all you know. I was once in your position, you know. I was the accused in our trial. You were? Before I left Japan, I I was accused of murder. And as strange as it might sound, the circumstances of the crime were pretty damn. I'm sure that no one believed it, it wasn't me who had done it. Oh, right now. But there was one person who stood up for me, who believed in me, and was prepared to defend me. My best friend. I don't ask him. No one believes in you more than I do. Leave this to me. All you need to do is put your faith in me, and I'll do the rest. I was so happy. I cried. But even then, somewhere inside of me, I couldn't help thinking. Sure, he doesn't really believe in me. Not completely. But I was wrong. As soon as my trial began, you know, it was obvious and that he had an absolute, unwavering belief in me. And in turn, I developed an absolute, unwavering belief in him. Since then, I came to realize, if you want someone to believe in you, you have to believe in the other person first. What are you saying? I promise you, Gina, that no matter what happens, I'll keep believing in you. So you don't need to worry. I won't let you down. Even though I'm a diver, and no good liar. You're not like McGillard. I know that. Eh? That's right. You're a fan, Genie. Iris. We know you better than you think. And we come to the conclusion that you're someone we can trust. 
Yes. And that's really all we need to know. Exactly. Um, it's not a door I... Um, I... Defendant General Lestrade and her legal representative. Court proceedings are about to resume. Please head into the court immediately. Alrighty then. In that case, let's go inside. And end this with a bang. Our final... Our final case here. Yes, of course. Thank you. Let's end this with a bang. I think both a defendant and a defending lawyer in my time. So I knew only too well just how hard it was to put all your faith in another. And I also knew just how hard it was to bear the burden of another putting all their faith in me. This is at last. The final chapter. The final battle. Wish me luck, Sato-san. And I hope you're watching over me too, partner. Alright, well... You can count on me as well, Ryonosuke, to get you through this. To save your ass through this. I hereby call this court to order as we resume the trial of Miss Gina Lestrade. Lord Von Zix, have you successfully subpoenaed the witness? The subpoena was delivered to the communication station where the man works in the ring, my lord. However, the heavy rain has delayed the arrival of his care. The heavy rain has delayed the arrival of his care, which you would see. Ah, of course. Hmm, I see. Now let us turn our attention to Inspector Gregson's princess of the case heard by the court this morning. The glaring omission of the third bullet in your report is a serious blunder, Inspector. Yeah, well, I, I can only apologize, my lord. Yeah, I mean... Again, I was going with... Uh, I, I At some point I was going with uh, the... With... Uh, the mentality, the idea that the bullet that was found on the calendar was actually the one that was shot through Sholmes. And they were talking about two bullets. Like, uh, the one um, that shot through Windyback and the one that shot through Sholmes. But since we found the third bullet on, uh, on Sholmes' body, like, on the, uh, what is it called? Like, vials? As such, huh? seems to me like you didn't do your job enough, police. I cannot permit such untried methods to be used as evidence in my courtroom. Huh. It's a big mistake to cuss Harry and me. A very big mistake. Yeah. Iris basically has the control of the police, whether you like it or not. It won't be... It won't be long until she has uh, the control over the entire government and such. Over the law system. My lord! The subpoena witness has just arrived in that building. Ah, nice. Thank you, officer. Show him to the stand without delay. Mr. Ragged Benedict. I didn't expect to be crossing paths with him again so soon. It's certainly not like this. Hello? Mr. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure character. <laughs> Thank you for complying with the court subpoena at such a short notice, sir. Well, of course, my lord. As an upstanding member of Lone and Society, it is my pleasure to oblige. Now, kindly state your name and occupation for the record. Ashley Graydon, Communications Officer. Ashley Graydon. Mr. Grade and I both work at London Central Communication Station. Now perhaps somebody would kindly explain what all this is about. You were appraised of this 
You were apprised of the situation by the court officer on your way here, I presume. Yes, I was. Something to do with a murder that took place at the pawnbrokers on Baker Street. And isn't some nonsense about me having been there on the night in question. And that is the accusation, indeed. This really is beyond a joke, you know. Very well. Without further delay, the court will hear your testimony now, Mr. Graydon. Yeah. We'll see if it's a joke or not. If it's something that you're gonna laugh at, or it's something that we are gonna laugh at. You respond to the accusation made against you under oath. <laughs> Gladly, my lord. Gladly. Gonna start uh, singing uh, like uh, that song myself. I I I never even watched uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Maybe maybe one day. When I will, when I will have a lot of a lot more free time. Naturally, I have the occasion to make use of pawnbroker services from time to time. But you are suggesting I colluded with these thugs to break into the place on the night of murder. I have no intention of admitting to such an outrageous accusation. Even if a certain parties were pure present claim that my blood was sown in the sea. Some scaramouche detective's homebrewed tincture can hardly be taken as serious evidence. Scaramouche? Such a funny, funny sounding word, if the way I'm saying it is right, if the way I pronounce it is correct. Scaramouche! So you denied the accusation completely, do you? I must say, I am dismayed. For the highest court in the land to be swayed by this self-professed detective story. He was the will of the jury. And our great British justice system demands that the jury's will is upheld. And it came from that person on the other side. And he is Japanese, so... You are... you are to take it to your own interpretation there. And then it would seem we have the misfortune of a most inept assembly of jurors today. By God! How long am I expected to be detained here? If, following the defense's cross examination, your involvement in this matter has not been established, you will be free to leave him. Good. Then I shall be away in time for afternoon tea. Some small consolation, at least. It does not hold up Mr. Graydon any longer than necessary, Consul. Proceed with the cross-examination. So, we meet again, Mr. Eckert Benedict. What is it, Mr. Graydon? My apologies. You are? Mediona Skinner Hado, defense lawyer. We have met, although, of course, you're gonna forget, since you are a person like that. Yeah, because, you know, something tells me that Edgar Benedict is going to be a bit of a bad person. Just saying. He, he, like, I'm just going to call like right now. He's not going to be a person that we're going to be sympathizing with. Like, up until this point in this adventure, um, we have dealt with a lot of unsympathetic uh, uh, culprits that were of higher status and such, like that first woman that that uh, uh, put, uh, that pinned the crime on Ronoski. I don't even remember her name. What was her name again? She is that forgettable in my eyes. Then there's McGilded and then there's this person who is more than likely going to be the culprit and... We're not going to think much of him after this. Like, he is going to be an unsympathetic asshole, and we're not going to think much of it. The rest of the, the cases with, um, with, um, like, case two and case four, those have been, um, quite the accidents and such. So, yeah. There is a little bit of a difference between the two situations that I described here. Uh, I do wonder if, uh, like, I do wonder if Pavlova is doing fine right now. 
and uh, Natsume as well. <laughs> I wonder what he is up to. Like, I know that he is now in Japan, I think, more than likely. Oh, sorry, I, uh, like, uh, what were you trying to say here, Graydon? I, I don't care. So. Yep. Oh, um, okay. Oh, well, thank you for the hat. <laughs> I'm just gonna put this in my collection <laughs> of hats. Although I don't, I don't really rock the, like the top hat, like the that huge top hat that often. I only rock the fedoras and such. Like I tried once, but eh, I trust we can conclude this quickly. Ugh. But I'm not holding your flashy hat while we do. <laughs> Might as well wear it yourself, I guess. <laughs> okay. The accusation. Unless, hold on. Yeah, are you giving us like free evidence over here that we can examine that is gonna bite you in the ass? Well, so far it doesn't seem like it. We don't see it as evidence that we can <laughs> that we can look at, but uh maybe if we hold on to this hat like long enough, we're gonna be getting some stuff. Yeah, we even met in the very palm brocade where the crime took place in the afternoon of the day in question. Though, of course, you introduced yourself by a different name at the time. It was Mr. Edgar Benedict, I believe. Tell me, what made you... No witness is here to testify about events that took place that night. He is under no obligation to answer such unrelated questions. You cannot be serious. Thank you. Because I certainly do not feel inclined to answer such an inappropriate question. Uh, it's gonna be evasive, that's for sure. And that's gonna be tricky. Alright, well, that didn't work. Second press. Have you seen these two men before? This pair. No. I don't associate with these bozos. Said by a man who introduced himself as Edgar Edgar Benedict. I like to know who I am to thank for. I like to know who I have to thank for this. Who made this outlandish accusation against me? That would be me and Ronoske, Mr. Edgar Benedict Cumberbatch, the young lawyer in black. This is a force. Let's move it. Whose idea was it to permit an outsider to work in a British court anyway? Well, needless to say. Okay, well, that didn't help us. Where were you at around 1 in the morning on the night in question, sir? That is past the hour at which I would normally retire. Certainly. I was not in the company of these rapscallions. You're able to prove that? I mean, let's... Let's keep this in mind. Those two clowns uh, mentioned a he. It could very well be him. They could very well be working under him. So, they are surely going to be hush-hush about this. Especially around him. And they are surely going to be like a weak point because you know what they say like uh, a chain is as weak as its weakest link or something like that for you appear to be under a gross misapprehension on this point what do you mean and the witness maintains he was not at the scene of the crime he has no obligation to prove his absence if your accusation is that the witness was present at the scene, the obligation lies with you to prove your assertion. Yeah, yeah. You will fulfill that obligation before putting any more unreasonable questions to the witness. Well, you know, we do... <laughs> oh my god, this, this guy. A silent victory wiggle. Thanks. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. But, yeah. I mean, we do have, like, the blood samples and such. But, 
you know how it is with these people. They are not gonna think much of... Uh... Wait, where the hell is... Uh... Ah, yeah, there goes. They are not gonna think much of uh, this portfolio, so we're gonna have to find some other evidence to prove that he was there at this point. Even if certain parties here present claim that my blood was found in the sea. Like, you would think that with someone like Shoms who has such high status and all, he would have some influence too, but I guess in court of law, not yet. <laughs> like I'm saying, not yet. Like I'm saying, not yet. I'm not saying uh, that he's never gonna. Blood was found in the scene of the crime. There's no question of that. Mr. Shums' chemical analysis has possibly identified the substance as such. But I'm not the only one human to have blood running through my veins, am I? How can be sure that blood is mine? It could equally be the blood of one of these two miscreants. Every individual's blood has a slightly different composition, it seems. Mr. Shums' chemical is able to differentiate the... Spare me the science lesson. Who is the Shums character anyway? Oh, I assume the Londoners would know the name. He is a great, uh, well, uh, renowned detective. He is quite infamous. So even you are able to bring yourself to say a great detective. A great detective, you say? <laughs> now we're in a realm of fair tales, are we? Oh, someone has a reaction. Hey, do we have like another fan of uh, Herlock Sholmes right over here? Do you have something to say about that, Mr. Skulkin? What? Me? N no, the other bozo. No, the Mr. Skulkin next to you. Right. I've had it up here with this. How many times have I gotta tell you? No, not you, Gregson. Yeah, I know. You're not big bro Skulkin. Mr. Nash Skulkin. There you go. Now I, now I remember the name. Uh, uh Cor, blame me, Governor. You what? Is it not the case that when Mr. Graydon just spoke, a thought went through your mind? Would you care to share that thought with the court? I, uh, me thought? I don't have none of them. It must have been them. I, you what? Mr. Naskolkin, answer the question, please. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Where did this come from, Ivanovsky? Like I know, we 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 are fiery right now. We are like, like in the last 100 miles right over here. I I think unless we're gonna have like another day of investigation and trial. In which case, <laughs> I um, like I I am heavily underestimating the length of this case, which was long enough. What went through your mind when Mr. Graydon just spoke? Nothing. Uh, honest guff. Nothing. I was just thinking. If you have his arms around like that much more, you'll open up the wound again, that's all. Eh, hey, wait, what? You'll open up the wound, you say? Mmm. What wound? Where he took the bullet, of course. It was only two days ago. He ain't gonna be healed up yet. So I was, um, well, you know, I was worried for him, man. Oh, that was pills. Mr. Gray, did you hear that? Jesus. Giving us like, uh, giving us this easy testimony right over here, just like that, without pressing, without giving some uh, evidence. Okay, we're gonna take this. Let's go, let's go with this. What? Yeah, you are holding your gun wound. In similar fashion to Manfred von Karma. Your comrade is worried about you, it seems. On account of your injured arm. And he got shot. And it was two days ago. Mmm. Quite a cosmic coincidence, man. My lord. Yes, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two wretches are talking about. Certainly, I shouldn't be expected to answer anything in relation to their mindless insinuations. Then why the hell are you... Are you holding your hand there? Hmm. We know that someone other than the victim was hit with a bullet at the center of the crime two nights ago. 
and from the height of the bullet hole in the wall, that person was likely in the upper arm of the floor whereabouts. Yeah, that's true. A bullet wound like that... Unless, again, we're going with the angle and such. Like, if we're going horizontal, then... It would more than likely be around somewhere in the chest area. From the chest area upwards. So, somewhere around the shoulder or the arm. Perhaps you'd allow a court official to examine your arm, sir. The left arm that you're currently clasping with your right hand, as if in pain. No, I refuse. You're gonna refuse? Oh my, quite the spunk on this fella. You have shown me no evidence whatsoever that links me to these common themes. Accordingly, I'm not obliged to permit any such invasion of my privacy. As I've already said, I'm completely uninvolved in all this. I've never had anything to do with the pawn brokery where this fellow was killed whatsoever. I take offense at the insinuation that I was in any way involved. Mm, you claim to have had nothing whatsoever to do with Mr. Weedybeck's pawn brokery. My lord, the defense would like la that last statement to be added to Mr. Graydon's formal testimony. Very well, counsel. Continue with your testimony, Mr. Graydon. Okay, well, let's see about this new testimony line. The bottom line is, I've never had anything to do with a palm broken, broken establishment where the man was killed. Hold it! Yeah, yeah. Never had anything to do with it. You forget that I was there, Mr. Green, on the very afternoon of the incident. I mean, where do you think that we got this uh, uh, music box disc with blood on it from you in the first place? But then again, we uh, we cannot really use uh, like uh, the blood sample portfolio and such for that to say that oh, we had this from the pawn brokery and this was uh, his blood, therefore he was there. We cannot use that, so... I mean... Actually, hold on a second. Wasn't, uh, wasn't Gregson there as well? Gregson, do you know? Don't you, don't you have like anything to say about that? Some, you know... He would totally be there. Obviously, I'm not a complete stranger to the Paul Brokers. I'm currently on the lookout for an armchair to furnish my study. Objection. No. You are there to redeem an article. I have no idea what you're talking about. Ah. Okay, it, it is like I said. Uh, Gregson has something in his mind. He has an objection of his own, probably, more than likely. Do you have something to add, Inspector? Um, come again, sunshine. You were there too, in fact, weren't you, Inspector? That afternoon. Yeah, I mean, you were trying to apprehend that guy, and then uh, uh, Graydon over here did his Spinaruni Jojo Bizarre Adventure style, and then he ran away. I, yeah, like uh, from what I remember. Uh, yes, I do remember meeting yourself in a palm brokers that afternoon. You, your young Japanese assistant. And the accused were all present, as I recall. And at that time, this witness, Mr. Graydon, was trying to acquire a particular article. Um, well now. I'm afraid I don't remember too clearly. Hmm. Gregson. Gregson, my boy, you're being very saucy right now. Eh? Uh, well, you must. I'm not going to lie and I pretend I remember something that I don't. What's going on here? Either Graydon truly is like a like a ghost, or Gregson is uh, hiding stuff from us. You know, I do remember. Like this one moment at the end of our investigation, like Gregson surely was lis listening in on our conversation with uh, with uh, Gina, 
at uh, the cells. He is being saucy. Rex, he showed us a picture before, didn't he? You know, from the cameras that Hernie installed in Weedy Banks. Yeah, of course. Indeed. And the gentleman pictured bears a striking resemblance to the witness, I must say. Exactly. It shows that Mr. Graydon was in the shop on the afternoon in question. Ah, well, there's that. At no point have I denied that fact. I merely entered the shop to peruse the particles on the sill, and never word with a broker. Nothing more. This makes no sense. I understand why Graydon might be trying to cover his tracks. But why would Gregson be trying to avoid giving testimony about what happened? Hmm... That's all he's going to say on the matter, is it? What do you think, Uno? I think he has no intention of telling us anything. He is well aware that the less he says, the less chance he has of giving himself away. Hmm... The complete opposite of Hardy, then. He seems to think that the more he says, the matter better. Unless I manage to prize a little more information from these witnesses' lips. From the other witnesses, that is. Oh, thanks to the Skulking Brothers. Yep, and they were the key to it after all. So he says he had nothing to do with Winnie Backs. Well, we know that's not true. But that would be a good time to have a proper look for the court record. Hmm, good idea. You never know what that what tiny scrap of information could become a valuable weapon. Hmm. Well, the thing is... Like, he... He never had anything to do with the palm working establishment. And... Gregson is being all sussy about this. Okay, I, I hope that uh, the word sussy is not going to become my new word of my of my dictionary. <laughs> I don't want to use it too often. Um, I, okay, we have the music box disc. This uh, can tell us that he was there. And he was like right in front of uh, uh, Gregson. Well, it it's not like this happened uh, right when Gregson appeared, but rather before. But the idea is that he was there, and this is a proof of ours. And... Well, Iris gave us the indication to go through the court record, so... And I think we pressed enough for this. We pursued two people. Let me see. Nothing there. Scuffing gun, go 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 go. What does this say? Pawnbroker perishes and pick purse plunder. Make little case notes. We're still gonna need that. Nah, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna present this. Like you're being suspicious as fuck, you two. Objection. Have you ever seen this this before, Mr. Graydon? Why? Is this supposed to mean something? This disc was, until the day of his murder, in pawn in Mr. Widdyback's shop. It was redeemed by the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, that afternoon. However, somebody mysteriously appeared to try to take it from her. And that somebody was you, of course, wasn't it, Mr. Graydon? As I have reiterated numerous times, you are mistaken. That was not me. I have never seen that this before in my life. He may have escaped your notice, but there is a small smear of blood on the disc. Ah, uh, yes. Resulting from a abrasion of the thumb, perhaps. That's right. The surface of the disc is covered in hundreds of tiny metal bumps. In the skirmish to acquire the disc, the thumb of the person who tried to take it suffered minor lacerations. So, while the disc bears the remnants of the skirmish in the form of this smear of blood, the form of the person in question must bear the remnants also. In the form of a scratch! 
Yeah, you know, that's true. Like, okay, you can argue with the blood thing that maybe multiple people would have the same type of blood, but for us to catch you with a with a scratch on the thumb, like coincidentally with uh, what would uh, look like uh, the wound on this disc, not the wound on the disc, but the wound that would be made with the disc like this, that would be quite a cosmic coincidence at this point. So yeah, give us your hand to check it out. Good gracious! Indeed it must. Mr. Graydon! How about you be a little bit of a good boy and let us examine your arm? Are you not going to refuse to allow us to examine your thumb? Because I have no doubt that it bears a small scratch consistent with the smear of blood on this disc. <laughs> oh well. You would seem I underestimated you. As everybody does. Everybody of your caliber. What is the meaning of this? So you admit it now. You admit you have a scratch on your thumb from when you attempted to take the disc from the defendant. Ora! Ora! Well, Mr. Graydon? It would appear there has been something of a misunderstanding here. I did not attempt to take the disc, as you put it. No, quite the reverse. Oh boy, now he's gonna spin it around and say that uh, Gina is the one who was taking the disc from him, that, he was, that she was stealing it. Which, technically, that's exactly what happened, so... Let's see if he can try and avoid that and uh, just stay on topic. It's really quite simple, you see. The disc was mine from the outset. Is there some crying and taking an item that you own out of, out of a pawn? It would seem, Mr. Graydon. And then this piece of evidence, my lone friend has established a link between yourself and the incident. Accordingly, you will tell the court everything you know about this disc now. As you wish. Though I'm quite sure it has nothing whatsoever to do with the pawnbroker's murder. Okay, we are we are avoiding that chaos with uh, Gina. Let's move on to the next testimony. There's a note on the disc saying, For me gilded, but the item belongs to me. The redemption ticket was stolen from me by the accused. The filthy guttering on the day in question. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> he is going to bring that up. I proceeded at once to the shop in order to explain my situation and redeem my article. In the end, of course, the disc was taken by the police. In other words, I had absolutely no reason to break into the shop later that same night. Did I hear you correctly, sir? You mean killed it, you say? The famous London philanthropist? Who perished in this very courtroom two months ago after being acquitted of distinctly messy murder. Yes, my lord. The one and the same. Good lord! Mr. Graydon! Are you saying that McGilded and yourself were acquainted? Yes, that's correct. Oh. Hmm. We're getting, we're getting some spice right around here. Hold on! Oh. I certainly didn't expect to hear that name uttered here in my courtroom again. According to what Jinan told us, this disc was placed in pawn on that fateful night two months ago. McKilded himself gave me instructions to deposit that windy box. It's funny that Mr. Graydon here is claiming that this belongs to him then, isn't it? In all likelihood, he is lying. So he appeared that afternoon at the windy box in order to get his hands on McGilded's disc for some reason. Counsel, you will commence your cross-examination, please. <sighs> okay. Well, let's see. Is there something I can do like really we fast over here without pressing everything? Uh, again, it's it's not something that we can really predict whether 
something will happen or somebody will have a reaction or something like that. Like, I'm looking to see if I can do something with evidence around here, like, real fast. And... Yeah, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it, so... Again, we shall clean this. Like, clean every statement. rub 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 a dub dub Would you care to explain how this belongs to you? As you will observe, a communications officer such as myself commands a fine cell. You are certainly exquisitely dressed, sir. Yeah. And that's all you got for yourself. So you see, I have little need to make use of the services provided by the Pong Grocery Trade. However, I did once find myself in difficulties having misplaced my purse while on an errand. Which is why I pawned my fine black overcoat to the broker in question. You claim that he was your overcoat? Obviously. And in my haste, I clean forgot that the music box disc was in its pocket. And yet, there is a note on it that reads, For me gilded. I am a collector of rare and unusual music box disc. Of the unusual music... I am a collector of rare and unusual music box music. M music box... M yeah, okay. I first met Mr. McGilded at the Gentleman's Club in the city, and was interested to discover that he shared my penchant in that area. So the disc in question, it's a pre-production song. I promised to let Mr. McGilded hear it. But then you forget that it was in the pocket of the world coat you were forced upon. Yes, exactly. Do you not need to mention any of that in her testament to Monsko, did she? No, because Graydon is a big fat liar right over here. Because McGilded had threatened her to keep her mouth shut. Which means that if we dig too deeply here, it's going to expose Gina's perjury. Uh... Oh dear. It's complicated, isn't it? Okay, let's um let's leave it alone for for the time being. Let's let's go at this like baby steps. Something tells me that we're not gonna be able to go through this as easily. So you're saying that Mr. Lestrade lifted the ticket from your pocket or bag? That's right. Despite being mindful of danger when walking in these celebrious areas, her kind frequent. Objection. Hey, you keep your mouth shut. Of course you would take that steps. But the girl is a regular offender. He came to the pawn burglary that day prepared with all the information he needed to identify the defendant. You were looking for her. That's what brought you to Wiedenbax. To get your hands on Mr. McGillet's disc. Objection. My learned friends, a veritable fond of nonsense. Nonsense. I concur with the persecution. Our defense right over here is a bag full of nonsense. Like one with the deepest with the deepest hole in it. That just spills like a lot of nonsense right out of him. A bag with not just one hole but two holes. Okay, we get it there, Judge, we get it. Counsel, you will refrain from conjecturing in this way. Is that clear? Yes, my lord. Then I will continue with my testimony, for what possible use it can be. Okay, got nothing out of that. Hold it! Had he ever been to Windy Bags before? Only once, for the purposes of pawning something. But like many, I enjoy browsing on such establishments. So when you notice that the pickpocket had taken your ticket, you chased after her. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I didn't notice at first, of course. Such is the art of the pickpers. But when I did, I headed to the pawn brokery at once, in order to reclaim my coat before the thief could. I was merely trying to recover what was rightfully mine in the first place. Uh, 
say what he likes because he knows he has no evidence to contradict him on this. Uh, okay. The disc was taken by the police. That is indeed true. Yeah, it was taken by Inspector Gregson here, wasn't it? That's right. This was the very man. Apparently, the police are collecting anything that has a connection to the field right? as evidence. Oh my. We have another reaction here, don't we? Excuse me. What is it this time, my fellow Gregson? Eh. Uh, well, um, what do you mean? I pressed the autoplay there for a second. The last remark Mr. Graydon made in his testimony seemed to trouble you in some way. Yeah. No, no he didn't. It's nothing. Leave it alone. Gregson! Let me ask you this, Inspector. Why is Colin Lear gathering Mr. McGill's possessions? I cannot tell you something like that, Sunshine! What is it, Inspector? Investigative secrets. Yes, exactly. You should know all about that. Magnus McGillot, who died so unexpectedly after his trial two months ago. A man renowned throughout the capital for his great contributions to public life. Yet he had a dark side, too. What are you going with this, Vazix? I suppose the police are dealing with the aftermath of his nefarious activities, are they? Th that's enough! The coppers like we have duties to carry out that we are not at liberty to talk about. Th th that's all you need to know. Duties conferred by Lord Strong, I presume. Lord Chief Justice appears to have great faith in you, Inspector. The bottom line is, you want to get more out of me. You're gonna need Lord Strokeheart's paw print first. Mm. We're getting in into some spicy stuff around here. Government secrets? Lord Chief's justice? Who am I? What's all this about? It's like there's something going on between Rex and Lord Von Zix here. Something that seems a little bit um, unrelated to our to our case. I do remember that we had like a newspaper about some stuff around here, wasn't it? Like something on the back, like something in regards to this. Ministry Mall. Classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice. Secret communications between Great Britain and its allies. Communications! You know... Now that I'm rereading this... I've heard the word communication somewhere. Fairly recent. Hmm... It's like us having this newspaper right, right over here, it's like fate. It's fate that we have this newspaper to help us eventually, I think. If we are gonna if we're gonna reach that kind of point. Mr. Graydon, let us return to your testimony. Glad you know. In other words, I had absolutely no reason to break into the shop later that same night. Hmm. Hold it! But perhaps you'd seen something of value among the forfeited items. No, not at all. Oh? A valuer was brought in by the police to assess everything in the shop. Without exception, every article in the shelves was common or garden. Break a break. In that case, it's clear that you broke into the shop later that day in order to recover Mr. McGilda's disc. Have you not been listening, man? 
even if I had wanted to recover the disc. You may recall that I'd been seized by the police that afternoon. He was no more in the shop that night than I. He was no more in the shop that night than I. As I keep saying, I simply had no reason to break in. Hmm. Wasn't there like something else that he was looking after? Like, uh, hold on, let me, let me look at the, the tickets right over here. The coat. A redemption ticket issued, issued from the property owned by the victim, Mr. Winneback. The blood that it has been identified as, as Mr. Mason. A redemption ticket issued from the palm broker owned by the victim, Mr. Winneback. One small box on the 13th February. Okay, well... Could it be that maybe you were looking for this box? I mean... Uh, I'm trying to remember right over here, like, the details about this... about this ticket. Like, it could very well be possible that uh, Graydon was looking for this small box that this ticket is talking about. Not necessarily, like... Uh, like the disc and such. There was something else. Hmm. It is past its date. Hmm. But still, even if uh, an item is past its date, that item would eventually end up on the shelves. So it's not necessarily that someone would actually buy it, like right after. It could have been possible that uh, Graydon bought it. Or stolen it on that night. Hmm. I mean, it's not like he had the chance to actually go after that box if he had anything to do with the particular box. Like, uh, at first, he had to confront the Gina about the stolen uh, uh, ticket. About the overcoat and the disc. And but by the time it all ended, Gregson appeared. So... He wouldn't have been able to go after that. So but there was nothing of Mr. McGillis left in the shop that night. Nothing that this man might have been after. I wonder if that's really true. Yeah, you know what? I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue this kind of uh, uh, topic right over here. Then he it. I don't see that it in the arrows. A shared expression of his crumble. Mr. McGill did slip the disc into his coat pocket and had it deposited at Winifax. Then, when he realized he was going to be arrested on a suspicion of the omnibus murder, he threatened Gina and forced her to take the redemption ticket. There's no doubt about it. A witness is lying for his pretty white teeth. But the police were obviously after anything left behind by McGillard as well. And that's why Inspector Gregson ended up taking the disc into custody that day. Gregson is being very strange about all this. There must be a reason for that, I'm sure. I just don't know what it is. Mm. For now, I need to focus on exposing the fact that Mr. Graydon is lying in his teeth. In his, in his teeth. In his testimony. Uh, okay, let me... Let me see about this... Uh, statement here. Okay, I think that everything is all good now. We can continue, but yeah. Uh, let's see about going with this kind of uh, path. See if we can go into the topic of the motive of trying to steal some box from the shop and such. So... Let's uh, present this like right over here. Let's see. Okay. This this was deposited at Winnie Backs on Magnus McGillis' instructions. You knew that, and you went there with the intention of obtaining it for yourself. Objection. Conjecture again. And in any case, the disc was taken into custody by the police that afternoon. Okay, well, can you please let Leonoski finish his uh, idea over here, Van Zeeks? The witness had no reason to visit the pawn broker again that night. Objection. 
Sorry, my learned friend. But that's not true. <laughs> what? Mr. Ingmi Gilded had another mod called Pawn at Willy Max. As this second pawnbroker's ticket proves. Huh. There were two articles belonging to Mr. McGilded in Windyback's pawn brokery. And the reason you broke into the shop that night was to recover the second one. Together with your two accomplices, the Skulking Brothers. <laughs> hmm. This is the second ticket, is it? What had the man deposited? The article description reads one small box. Wait, something tells me that it has something to do with, uh, like, uh, music? Maybe like a small... Uh, <sighs> like a small compatible... Well, not compatible, but rather... Compact? Like, music box disc? Like, music box? Rather vague description, it seems to me. You're suggesting that I broke into the palm broker with these. Clowns in order to steal some trinket box. I believe there are adequate grounds to suspect you did. This is absurd. Why on earth would I do such a thing? Once the article had been forfeited, I could simply walk into the shop and purchase it. There will be absolutely no need for me to resort to theft. Huh. Oh, is that so? Well, unless you've seen the ticket for yourself like right now. Since it may like, unless you saw the ticket right now and in its description, how did you know that it was past its date? That's a good point. Hmm, indeed. The way this makes a solid argument. But nonetheless, the point still stands that it is past its point. Maybe he didn't get the chance to get that, uh, uh, get that box. But then again, you could have also done it like the second day. But maybe you desperately needed like that at that point, otherwise something bad might happen. So that means that for some reason, this Graydon fellow needed a small box that very night, does it? Yeah, yeah, very well can be. It's time to put an end to this nonsense, my lord. Could you be a little less cryptic, Lord Van Zix? And less edgy? I'd wait to ruin my learned friend's argument, but the truth is quite incontrovertible. On the night in question, no small box was taken from Winnibeck's pawn brokery. And rest assured, persecution can prove it. Oh my! <laughs> Spooky! Okay, well, I guess you're gonna tell us that uh, you did manage to, like, well, not you, but rather the police managed to scour the entire shop to see if anything was missing, and you have proof of that. Good gracious! Inspector. Show the photographic prints to the court, if you please. Yes, sir. What prints? These prints were taken from one of the detective security cameras. Ah, Harry is red-handed recorders again. It is previously explained using this plan of the shop layout. And the victim's establishment was furnished with automatic cameras in two locations. One was set to capture the counter where Mr. Wittybag received his customers, and the other was set to capture the shelves on which articles were placed for sale once forfeited. I'm realizing this. Like, remember when we were at the shop and we can go from from the left side to the right side, like like uh, in the other cases, like gameplay-wise, we can do that. <laughs> we were switching between cameras in this case, like, we were switching between cameras to see, like, the two sides of the shop. That's a, that's a cute little detail there. But yeah. According to the information on this ticket, Mr. Miguel's small box had been forfeited already. Two days before the incident, 
at 9 p.m. on 14 April to be precise. Which means it would have been on the shelves of forfeited items in the shop front. Now, what I have here is a print taken by one of the cameras about two hours before the incident. That's at 11 p.m. of 18th April. 11 p.m. Okay. Hmm. The victim certainly had a very full shop, it would appear. And then here we have another print. This one was taken about two hours after the incident. Okay, so what you're gonna try and say over here is that there is no difference between the two, meaning that that nothing was stolen from the from these shelves. Okay. Well, well, first of all, I have to see these for myself. I want to check these. So we have two pictures to compare. Spot the difference. Though I, mu though I must say that placing them side by side leaves me cold. Okay, I think that this is perfect for me to see. Although something tells me that we're not gonna see that much of a difference. Like, first hand, I... Da, 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 like, I keep switching between the two sides over here. Do, 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 do. Let's see if there's anything... Nothing with the big stereoscopic device on the right, nothing with the horsey vases, like the like the hat on top. I don't really see like any difference to first hand. But second of all, like who knows, maybe this small box that they're talking about, whether well I was thinking that maybe it was a music box, like a small music box that would play these discs and I mean, you know for these music discs you do need specific uh, boxes to play them otherwise it's not gonna be effective I mean, that's what the Shoms told us before so that's why I'm saying that maybe Graydon needed a box as well for that to play the music disc otherwise it's not gonna work so that's what I'm thinking but it would have to be like for my second idea it would have to be really 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 small so that well maybe that small box would be inside like a another small <laughs> another box in which case maybe we'd have some boxes around here but like for example the one on top right like right there with scribbles on it as if it looks like a shoe box if you can see it Maybe the small box was inside that. Like, have you checked them yourself? Eh, you probably didn't. Like, if you're placing your, like, your um, proof on, uh, on nobody stealing that box based solely on this, then that is surely a failure in my eyes. Dear me, that's starting to make my head ache. Obviously, at Scotland Yard, we consider theft as one possible motive in this case. We explore the possibility that something had been taken in addition to the victim's life. So you men have already compared these two prints for the inspector? Yes, sir. We counted every single item in each of these two photograph prints. And the Yard's conclusion is that exactly the same number are present in both. Hmm... In other words, nothing was taken from the palm broccoli on the night in question. Let me... Let me check this particular camera right over here, maybe. And the thing is, it's kind of difficult for me to check if I have to... Like, I need them on both sides here, but I definitely cannot. Box? Box? Box, box, box? Like, this one is at 1 a.m. before Graydon arrived, and this is at 1.30 a.m. Hmm. 
Like, I'm not really noticing any difference at first, but if we were to find something, maybe we can find it here, because, well, we did notice, like, the shift in movement for those objects on the counter. Maybe there's something else that I'm missing over here that I'm not seeing. Hmm. I guess we shall see. And my learned friend's assertion is nothing more than a hopeful fantasy. <laughs> oh, believe it. If I could have just shown that he had stolen the Gilded's palm blocks, I might have been able to break him down at last. You know what we know? I've been thinking. I wonder if these two photographs really are exactly the same. You're saying that we should uh, use uh, Jordan Murphy to help us here? Yeah, that is a good idea. Maybe we can uh, also find like a difference. Like maybe, maybe there is um, like a difference between the two, and something was missing. It's just that you cannot really see like like that. Maybe you can uh, see a difference stereoscopically. So, counsel. In the light of the evidence put forward by the prosecution, what is your position? It seems that in fact, on the night in question, nothing was stolen from the victim's establishment. Do you accept the prosecution's assertion? Hmm, I don't know. Could there be some hidden discrepancy in these two photograph prints somewhere? There's no discrepancy, point out that discrepancy, use a piece of evidence. A piece of evidence? Hmm. Well, we definitely can point out the discrepancy as long as we check with the journal number three or use a piece of evidence. What would that piece of evidence be? Uh. Ah, we also have like uh, the compatible, compa oh, like, uh, compatible. God, what what is the word? Like, I'm missing the word. Compact? Uh, I am forgetting the word. <laughs> what is wrong with me today? Um, portable. Yeah, there you go. The portable, not com compact or <laughs> com comfortable. Uh, like the portable stereoscope. Yeah, we can definitely use like um, like a um, uh, like uh, the portable stereoscope. Should I? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think we should. Before I get my answer, my lord, I'd like to try something, if I may. Try something? What do you mean, Consul? I need to use a certain piece of evidence from the court record to identify the discrepancy. Yeah, when you when Ryanosuke phrase it like that, it's gotta be like the... It's gotta be our good old friend, Stereoscopy. Scopy. That's gonna be our friend's name. Scopy. I'm not entirely sure I fall. Which piece of evidence do you intend to use to help you identify the discrepancy between the two prints? It be our friend over here, Stereoscopy. Hello! It's time for me to shine! I'd like to use this device, my lord. To view the two prints stereoscopically. Ooh! Yes! You've got the bug at last! You can't resist it, can ya? Got a cross-eyed composition. And you're number three. What a surprise. Come on, Rina. Let's put the pictures in place. You see what this wonderful contraption shows us. Alright. Stereoscopy. Say, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. And just uh, insert these photos inside and see. There we go. Now look for the eyepiece. Oh. Okay. So it's <laughs> just just like that. Wow. So it's that? I wasn't sure at first, but there's a clear discrepancy between these two prints. What? Did I actually miss that, maybe? Hmm. You must identify the location in question for the court council. Then again, it's not like I uh, do like um, spot the difference games like daily. I used to do those, like, at some points in the past, but... 
Yeah, maybe I missed it when I was uh, looking at both the photographs initially. Maybe I could have just pointed them out myself. Indicate the precise look. Indicate the precise location of the discrepancy of which you speak. Well, that's being like right over here. Hold on. Uh, take, that. take that. Take this and that. Granted, these two prints are almost like them. However, there is one minor discrepancy between them. What? When you view the two pictures... Hmm... A single area stands out as being different. The location of the small box. Ah, the location. Oh. Okay. Wait. Unbelievable. Yeah, you can see it yourself. I'm glad that our friend Scopy is uh, is being being able to help you as well, Vazix. But yeah, maybe I was right uh, with what I was saying before. Maybe our... Maybe the box that uh, Graydon wanted was inside that box, like in, like in the photograph. And, well, technically that box was not stolen, but it was moved. Maybe Graydon moved that box in order to, to get the smaller box from inside it. He had to move it in order to get to what he needed. So, yeah, it could be that. Or maybe that's the small box? Hmm. By Jove! Right! How extraordinary! Well, this toast is very simple. Megillah's small box was indeed not stolen from Wendy Bax on the night in question. However, there can be no doubt that somebody picked up this sort of box and then returned it to its place on the shelves. Oh, okay, there's also that possibility that they returned it at some point. Uh, suggesting that the small box originally deposited by me Gilded is in fact... Yep, the very same small box I just identified in those photographic prints. Objection. Mindless guesswork. What if it was? So box was moved to the on the shelf. Nothing was stolen. Which means, quite simply, that nothing has changed. That may be true, but... Alright, Mikhail's box wasn't stolen. But does the, fact, does the fact that it was moved like that change things? Hmm... I'm gonna say that it does. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say that it does. Why limit ourselves? I cannot really point my finger on what it changes exactly. Like, I don't know, maybe... Uh, like, I was thinking that maybe Graydon needed it, like, permanently on him to use the disc. Like, if I'm to think of a small music box. But if it's something else, eh, who knows, maybe... Maybe he needed what was, uh, like, he needed that box for for something, like go around the corner, talk to somebody, or negotiate it, or use that box on something, like completely, something completely different that we don't know of, and then they would put the box back there, like really fast. Hmm. How can that possibly be? And the crucial point is the fact that what was moved was a small box. In other words, we have to consider what might have been inside that box. And yeah, let's not forget that it's a box. Like, the one thing that we see different between the two pictures is a box, similar to the ticket. So, it is, it is quite a coincidence, or more than just a coincidence. What are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that we need to examine that box, as soon as possible. A vital piece of evidence is sitting on the shelves at Weedy Bax as we speak. Objection. That won't be necessary. 
Some little box belonging to a man who died two months ago can't possibly be relevant to this trial. The court does not uphold your objection, Lord Van Zix. Bailiff, arrange for an officer to go to Baker Street at once. Obtain the small box in question and bring it back here for further examination. We should have a report within half an hour. I think perhaps we should recess for a short while until the evidence is brought forth. To be hoodwinked by such a farce. <laughs> Disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Razix? This is nothing but a smokescreen. A Nipponese speciality, you would see. Oh boy. Yeah, quite... Yeah, quite a variety and racist comments there when it comes to our learned friend here, Zeke's. What are you trying to say? My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the very beginning. That this witness's intent was to steal an article belonging to Mr. McGilda from the pawn brokery. Yet common sense tells us that none of the articles have value enough to be worth stealing in the first place. Exactly. It would be beyond absurd to break into a place for the purpose of stealing such commonplace property. Mm, well, actually, well, we don't know how valuable that box is until we see it for ourselves. Hmm. I mean, do you Zix know how valuable that box is? Like, what it is exactly? Can you tell us? Judge, what do you think? If your lordship recalls, Mr. McGill did perish two months ago, immediately after the conclusion of his trial. A trial in which he was found not guilty. A trial in which it was established he was the upstanding member of society his reputation implied, in fact. Ah, oh, come on, Zix, you know you don't believe that. So I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most insightful defense. The articles of his upstanding member of society pawned were entirely ordinary. A black overcoat that just happened to have a music box disc in one of its pockets. And a small box. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if this man tried to make a gift of such things to me. No, that does make rather a lot make more sense. It's not if he was gold or jewels, is it? Goodness knows, Mr. McGill was rich enough. But he cannot deposit cash in a palm brokery. The prosecution's argument is undeniably compelling. It is incumbent on the defense now to bolster its argument. To explain what possible significance these commonplace articles pawned by this fine citizen could have. Oh, counsel? Is your argument, in fact, demonstrable? Are you able to show proof that the disc or the box are in any tangible way related to this case? <sighs> Man, are we... We are really impatient, aren't we? Like, we could just wait and see. Like, the box ourselves. But, okay, proof that... That the two are related, that the box is related to this case, besides that ticket. Again, I'm thinking of the small box uh, for music, that it is a small music box that would be used for that disc. You cannot use that disc without using a, like a music box. But if it's not that, then... <sighs> what else could it be? What's the matter, you know? 
We know that they're related, don't we? They're both other pieces of evidence. Like, maybe, maybe that box has, uh, like, important documents that would relate to some uh, government secrets, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, of course. You and I both know that. We know McGillis' true character. And we know that this was significant. Even if we don't know why. But if we explain all that to the court at this point, we'll have to acknowledge that McGillis' acquittal two months ago was a mistake. Okay, well, in which case, we can talk about that. Like, we have like, well, 25 minutes until we, we get that box back. We can talk about the, the case from two months ago. That the defense's argument was flawed, based on false information. Oh no. And that would mean admitting that Gina committed perjury. Mahini. Could it be that Van Zix knows? Uh, you know, that is a good point. Like, okay, let's say that we reveal, like, the true details of two months ago, that McGill that was an asshole that killed and such, but that technically does make uh, Gina to be a accomplice to the case, which would definitely not be in our favor in this particular trial, because we are basically piling on uh, on the stuff for Gina. Hell, like, we reveal that she is an accomplice to that case, even if we were to reveal to them that, uh, that McGilda was the one responsible, <sighs> technically Gina is still gonna be put in jail, I like, guess she is still gonna be in jail for that particular case, not this one, <laughs> like we, we have her, uh, like we win this case, we, we save uh, uh, Gina from this, but on the contrary, uh, she will be put in jail for for the case from two months ago, which... I don't know. Well, you know, what? Uh, actually, what the fuck am I talking about over here? If we were to convince the judge that Gina was forced into being an accomplice over here, there's no way that they're gonna put Gina in jail for that. For for McGilded's crimes, fuck that. Let's talk about it. Is that why he's doing this now? Because he anticipated everything. But maybe this could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry, what do you mean, Nars? Well, what is it that you always say, Reno? Sooner or later, the truth comes out every time. Yeah, that is a good point. Alright, the exact significance of the things that Mikhail deposited with Mr. Windyback is something that only Gina can explain to court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about that, it could quickly damage our chances of winning this case. What's the right thing to do here? We're gonna have Gina testify for this. Sorry, Gina, but you have to trust us on this one. My lord, the defense would like to make a proposal. Oh? What proposal, counsel? While the court awaits the arrival of McGillard's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's to do with the various articles deposited at Witty Bags by Mr. McGillard, my lord. Mr. Stroud has information belong relating to them. I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. Also, like, now I'm thinking about this. Gina was talking about a particular box, uh, like from two months ago when the incident happened. Maybe the two are actually the same. Hmm. It will prove the significance of the articles in question, once and for all. Well, well. Things are becoming interesting. I presume you have considered the implications of the testimony you are proposing. In particular, the impact it will have on the accused stand, and indeed your own. 
Ooh. Does this mean that Zeke's knows as well what may have actually happened? He is thinking ahead. He knows what uh, what Weronosuke may is trying to do here. Yeah. I have. Lord Von Zix, would you care to explain that last remark? The persecution accepts the defense proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. Very well, if you have no objection. So, the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Ms. Jenna Lestrade. Your witness currently in the stand may step down until further notice. And I shall bid you good day. Wait. You, sir, shall remain in the stand while Mr. Strahd testifies. Ooh. As you wish. Good move. Alright, Angina. It's time. Maybe we're gonna have some... Uh, Suspicious reaction from um, Graydon while Gina testifies. I know this would be hard, but please, put your faith in me here. Good luck, Renal. The articles that McGill had deposited in Windybag's palm broker are intimately related with the omnibus case, the trial which was heard in this courtroom two months ago. Yeah, and I remember this young lady being brought be before me in that trial as well. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped to establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGill. The omnibus case was intriguing to say the least. And now here we are all again. The same players in a trial facing each other once more. A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Round two of working together to solve a particular mystery and make things right. Allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running along London's winter streets. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the cage, Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. But as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged. That the murder, in fact, took place above the defendant's head on the roof deck. With the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Mr. Strahd whose testimony brought that possibility to light. At the time of the incident, Mr. Strahd was concealed under a seat in the carriage, hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. Then, immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilda died in this very court, in the most extraordinary of circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even now, two months on. As indeed does the omnibus murder itself. Be that as it may, I recall neither the this nor the small box being mentioned in the course of those proceedings. It's a shot. Would you tell the court now, please? What really happened in the omnibus two months ago, I mean. I don't know what you mean. I already said all of what I know. And what about everything you told us yesterday from inside your prison cell? Please, Mrs. Strange. This is extremely important. But... Remember, Loco. If it transpires that you willfully withheld information in the trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. 
and naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts. You have little credibility to lose. Genie, don't listen to him. Please, you have the chest ruiner now. Yeah. I know that we're putting you on a difficult spot right over here by revealing this stuff. But it is very important for this particular trial. And if we do this right, then everything will be will be fine. We swear. Iris. We're on our side. Then, I'll talk. It's the right choice, you know. Well, it seemed that my learned friend is hell-bent on bringing the entire courtroom down about his ears. So be it. I must confess that I'm struggling to understand what on earth is happening here. However, it would appear that McGilvitt's pawned articles and that extraordinary case of the omnibus Harbor secrets of which we have been hitherto unaware. So, Mr. Strad, you will now give your testimony before the court about the event about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth. A commodity is sorely lacking in your original statements. And this is it then. Everything is going to come out. Like Van Zeek said. And this could bring the whole courtroom down about my ears. But as a lawyer, I'm prepared to take that risk. It's gonna get spicy, that is for sure. <laughs> the real truth of the Omnibus case. Truth is, that brick member cub was in the cabin of the Omnibus the whole time. When the Irishman dragged me out from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from over my head, and the power on the roof deck went off to call the loop, the slops. That's when McGill had slipped the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop around the month. He fed me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I'd seen or heard. Good grief. This is outrageous! What you just told the court bears almost no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then there's every chance I may have adjudicated an error in Miguel's trial. It sounds very much to me as if the man deliberately deceived this court. What a big surprise! In an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Without doubt, your lordship is correct. A great injustice was done in this courtroom two months ago. The actions of the accused in that trial, of this witness, and of my learned friend are entirely inexcusable. I don't believe it. The whole trial was a farce. It was all lies. And the guilty fellow was running to the court. Don't forget the lawyer from the East. They were all in on it together. You're wrong, the lot of you. Miss Narado, the lawyer there, he didn't know nothing about it. Humbug! I don't think so. I really expect her to believe that. He really stitched everything up. He really stitched everyone up, didn't he? What an operation to get the man off scot free. Oh, fuck you. Stop. The lies have to stop. Stop. Yes, the defense made a terrible error of judgment. I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However, it's imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on her testimony. Because the true significance of McGill's pawn articles must be brought to light. Mm, very well, my learned student friend. Ah. You are not going with my Nipponese friend, or my learned friend, learned student friend. Given the depths of calamity you have just plunged yourself into, this may well be worth hearing. Words fail me. 
The situation is utterly deplorable. Miss Norodo. Uh, yes, my lord. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. I mean, Miss Narodo. Now, Consul, pursue the cross examination. So, we gotta make this right, because not only do we have Gina on the line, but also Norodonosuke, apparently. Phew, okay. Truth is, that brickmaker cub was in the cabin of the Mumnibus tomb the whole time. Okay, well... Yeah, you know, I, I think we should uh, press everything and see what she has to say about each of these statements. It's not like we're f we're trying to find like a contradiction over here or anything like that. So, yeah. And you were hiding in the cabin at the time as well, weren't you, Mr. Stroud? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of those seats. Yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at all. Now, in your testimony two months ago, I feel certain that you claim McGilda was the sole passenger, did you not? False testimony, my lord. That's... that's what he told me I'd, I had to say. But it's important that you tell us the truth now. Were Mr. McGilded and the victim acquaintances? I don't know. But I did hear him talk a lot. What were they talking about? Well, I couldn't hear too well. But if I had to say... I think it was about money or something. They kept talking about buying and not buying. Hmm, perhaps business dealings of some kind. But anyway, they got louder and louder. It started to sound like a proper fight. Hmm, it is quite suspicious. Well, what is, um... Well, what is Graydon, like, uh, pose there? He's pretty scared by them. I already dared to breathe, and then all of a sudden, I had a noise like someone killing over on the floor. It was blooming loud and all. And I believe you let out an involuntary scream. Yeah, that's what gave me away. When the Irishman dragged me out from another seat, I saw that desk on the floor. Was the, was the disc you saw this disc? Yeah, I reckon it probably was. He was right next to the curve lying on the floor. Like, I am expecting uh, <laughs> uh, some reaction from uh, Graydon about all this. I bet that uh, Graydon doesn't even want us to talk about this. The reason why, more than likely, he is facing us with his back, like right there. Could this disc have belonged to the victim, perhaps? I don't know. But McGilde picked it up pretty smartish. And he inset the cove with a knife in his belly up on the seat. And what did he say to you at that time? He told me not to say a word about what I'd seen or heard, no, heard to no one. About the disc and all. I was dead scared. The way he was looking at me, I thought... If I didn't go along with it, I get stuck with that knife too. Hmm. Then he started asking me a lot of questions. Like what my name was and where I lived. He asked me about being a diver too. But after a while, what happened in the carriage was noticed. Yeah, that's right. First there was a kind of rapping noise. <laughs> okay, so there were two gentlemen occupying the seats on the roof deck, I believe. 
That's right. He must have looked down through the skylight and noticed the cove with the knife in his guts. And he screamed. The driver pulled up the horses and Gild Megilda got me out of sight. Out of sight? Where? Back under the seat where I started off. Once the carriage came to an halt, the two coats from the roof ran off to fetch the stops. If they immediately left to fetch the police, it appeared they were entirely unrelated to the incident. Hmm. So that left McGilda, the driver, and you still and you still at the scene. Yeah. Only the driver didn't know I was there because I was on the seat. Yeah, like so far. And so far, Graydon is uh, acting quite. Hello there. <laughs> what the? Okay. Alrighty then. I see. So you weren't just. <laughs> you weren't just uh, facing your back to the court as if trying to hide your face or anything like that. You're having like some talk with uh, with uh, Greg Snowy here. Huh. Okay. It is suspicious. I heard the cabin door open, and a voice from outside. Can I actually pursue them? I mean, it's not like they're... they like, we have like any reaction to pursue them, but... Uh... Is there something you'd like to share with the court, Inspector Gregson, and Mr. Graydon? Inspector! Mr. Graydon! Blimey, you're trying to give me a heart attack? You have been whispering to each other for quite some time now. <laughs> they, they were, were they actually uh, talking to each other like uh, for the first lines like all that damn time? I didn't even notice that. I, I, uh, I thought that, uh, that uh, Gregson was just uh, facing his back to us. I didn't even know that Gregson was still here. <laughs> Tell us, what is the discussion about? Discussion? This fella? Pull the other one, sunshine. You think I've got anything to talk about, about with a shady jet like this? I don't know. You were being very hesitant in talking about uh, this guy, like, earlier on. And I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective, after he deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. I've clearly been talking the entire time I've been cross-examining Gino. It's as if they've been negotiating. You will kindly refrain from talking amongst yourselves while the witness is giving testimony. Yeah, um, sorry, my lord. What were those two talking about? Mr. Strahd, continue with your testimony, please. Uh, I mean, don't tell me that Gregson is a bad person. Like they are, they are both conspirators. Like they are in on some on some shady stuff, and eventually we're gonna have a Gregson in prison as well. Yeah, that's when McGill did slip the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop, run. Wait a minute. What did that change, though? Something changed here, didn't, didn't it? Or... Okay, hold on, let me... Uh, let me go through this again. Should we... Uh, should we go through this again? Or... Are you guys talking to a chart? No? Okay. <laughs> Maybe it was necessary for us to progress through this, otherwise we're gonna keep uh, cross-examining Gina, and then nothing would happen. I heard the cabin door open, and a voice from outside. The driver, yes. You also testified in the trial, I believe. A fellow who went by the name of Beppo, if memory serves. Beppo! 
what did Mr. McGilden and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened. And stuff like that mainly. That's when McGilden slipped the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop roundabout. Right That pawn shop obviously being with the backs on Baker Street. J just a moment, Counsel. Do, do you mean to tell me that the driver gave false testimony in that trial as well? Yep. Beppa was on was in on it as well. Perhaps the excursion to the pawn workplace slipped his mind when he was in the stand. Indeed, Lord Von Zix. You know, there is something bad about the system. When even a driver of a carriage has to do this sort of stuff in order to get some money for his food and survival in life. How about you guys, uh, like, uh, try to give uh, your guys, like, more money and more comfort when doing their job? Otherwise, this sort of stuff wouldn't happen in the first place. I'm just saying, you know. Miguel took off his coat and gave it to the driver. He followed it up, all careful like before I ending it over. When I saw him do that, I remember thinking, dead code and what's in it, that's gotta be worth a few bob. Yeah, Gina was sure that this must be worth them more than Mr. Windybag was suggesting. Wasn't she? I remember her quibbling with him over the price that afternoon at the pawn broker. The driver looked pretty happy when McGill flashed some press in his face. He went running off at a lick. Then the bog trotter called me and told me to come out from the drag's cabin. <sighs> okay. And then he threatened me not to snitch. Friend me how exactly? Told me I'd only be able to scarp if I did exactly what he said. Which included giving false testimony in court two months ago. Yeah, that's right. And there was one other thing he said. Are you guys cool? Okay. <laughs> Just checking. Which was... He told me I'd have to hang on the ticket from the pawn shop. And make sure not to lose it. The ticket? Well, I never... Said that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off before two months passed, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in luck to stop it in being forfeited. He left me with some brass to pay for it. Oh, really? Why on earth would McGilded have done such a thing? It wasn't his overcoat with a pawn broker before the arrival of the police. It makes no sense at all. And there would seem to be only one logical explanation, my lord. What McGilded had the driver deposit at Winnie Bags was something he didn't want the police to see. Yeah, more than likely. Something very important that he needed to hide at all costs. Anyway, after that, he let me go. So I let it before the copper showed up. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Strad. Thank you, Consul. I've heard enough. I really now have a reasonable understanding of what actually had transpired on the omnibus. Okay. You were up here on that night two months ago. A negotiation was taking place on the omnibus. A negotiation concerning this disc. However, matters did not run smoothly. When parties involved began to quarrel over price, Megillah took what he wanted by force. At the expense of the other man's life. Which proves my point. The disc is clearly extremely valuable in some way. Although I don't understand why as yet. And two days ago, precisely two months after the omnibus incident, Miguel's code and its contents were due to be forfeited. I didn't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the cove died right after its trial. I knew that. So you decided you would try to claim the articles as your own. Well, why not, eh? They were only gonna be forfeited. Why shouldn't I have gotten them? Anyway, you can't blame me for thinking about it. Thinking ain't no crime. 
<laughs> Mr. Strand, it would appear Mr. McGilda was preparing to kill in order to take possession of this disc. Do you know why that would be? Eh? I ain't got a clue. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of brass. He's probably gonna sell it. And you can't blame me for thinking that. Thinking ain't no crime. <laughs> Imagine that that's gonna be her thing. Like her running gag. She's always gonna say that. My lord! The evidence your lordship requested has been located and is ready for the court's inspection, sir. Alright, well, we got our box over here. The mysterious little box, deposited by McGilda two months ago. There's no doubt in my mind that it's a key piece in this far-reaching puzzle. 